Well, thank you. Thank you, Jennifer, for inviting me. I really like the topic of this whole meeting and uh, the spirit of the meeting and the venue of the meeting, so basically everything about it. Um, so uh, I don't know what the final title of my talk was listed as, but um, I've decided to focus in on one project that we've been doing. Uh, and I just have this slide up here to, I don't know, just tell you the, a range of things that my lab actually does that I'm not going to talk about. So we make, uh, we use chemical biology to make light sensitive ion channels and receptors. I'll tell you a little about that with one specific, specific kind of receptor. But we've managed to sort of photosensitize a whole range of different voltage gated ion channels. Uh, mainly potassium channels, as well as a lot of neurotransmitter receptors, acetylcholine receptors, glutamate receptors, GABA receptors. And this is all so that we can understand what these receptors do in, in the nervous system. Uh, and, and then we use them. Uh, we use them both on the retina, where we're trying to install light sensitivity in blind retinas to, as a treatment, possibly, for blindness, and also to understand processes in the brain. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. So, um, so th this is sort of a summary of what I'll talk about. First, I'll explain what this technology is all about and how it works, uh, convince you that it works, uh, and then we're going to apply it to LTP. And, um, and we've come up with something I think that's it's sort of interesting for this topic in particular, having to do with metaplasticity. And then at the end, I, it would be great if people had, you know, thoughts about, uh, about th this special, you know, sort of maybe a little bit different role that GABA receptors uh, play in plasticity. So, um, so right. So GABA A receptors are ligand gated ion channels that conduct chloride, and they are pentameric proteins. They're heteromultimers of five subunits. Uh, there are two alphas, two betas, and a non-alpha beta, which is often a gamma subunit. And this protein binds GABA in two places at the interfaces between the alpha and the beta subunits. And so what we want to do is make these receptors uh, become sensitive to light. So the way we do this is, first of all, we find a place that we can tether a, photoisomer a photoisomerizable molecule, and that took a bit of hunting and mutating uh, the receptor. In particular, we focused on the alpha subunit, uh, and we substituted a cysteine for whatever the native amino acid was, because that's a good uh, amino acid where you, can, where you can do chemistry and actually tether other molecules to it. There are very few free cysteines on the extracellular surface of, of most membrane proteins, and including these GABA receptors. So this is the photoisomerizable molecule. This is just an example of one that we used. It has this chemical group called malayamide, <clears throat> which reacts irreversibly covalently with a sulfhydro group on cysteine. Uh, so once you attach this, it stays on for days, maybe even weeks. It's pretty much a permanent attachment. There's a, an azobenzene, that's really the core of this molecule, which is photoisomerizable. So here it is in its trans configuration. And if you hit it with the right wavelength of light, you can get it to convert to the cis configuration. And it will relax back to trans spontaneously, but it takes time. If you hit it with a longer wavelength photon of light, you can accelerate that relaxation a lot. And so that means you can control, you've got one foot on the gas and one foot on the brake, basically. And then on this end of the molecule is some ligand, and we used a variety of different things. It turns out it doesn't even matter that much, because once you tether this in the right place, this end of the molecule just falls into the binding site for that GABA normally occupies. <clears throat> and that's kind of shown here. Here's one of these molecules tethered on that orange amino acid, uh, which is now a cysteine. And, uh, and here's the molecule. This is the azobenzene part of it. And here's the ligand sitting in the GABA binding site in the trans configuration. But if you photoisomerize it, you see it sort of kinks back and it, uh, it, it opens up the binding site so the GABA can bind. 
So, um, so we've converted, so basically this is a light antagonized uh, GABA receptor. And so if you express this receptor in any expression system, but here's a xenopacellocyte, which is sort of old fashioned, uh, using two electrode voltage clamp, which is even more old fashioned, uh, you can, you can show that if you puff GABA on this, on this oocyte, you, you elicit, uh, a chloride current, an inward chloride current in this case. And, uh, if you extend this photo switch into its trans configuration with three, with 500 nanometer light, now you, have occupied the GABA binding site and you antagonize this current and it's completely reversible and you can go back and forth hundreds of times. There's no photo bleaching of the molecule. <clears throat> it's not 100% effective, but it's, pre it's pretty good. Um, and, and if you uh, generate um, uh, uh, concentration response curves, you can see that as you switch between 380 nanometer light, which is the cis form, and 500 nanometer light. Essentially, you're add, it's like adding a competitive inhibitor. Uh, the, now you need a, high, a higher concentration, much higher concentration of GABA to elicit the same current. And, and, you can, and in fact, one of the important things that we want to make sure of, because we want to understand, the, we want to use this to understand the role of these receptors, we don't want the mutation itself to alter the function of the receptor. We want to be able to turn off the antagonism completely when we're in the, in the uh, transform, I'm sorry, the cis form of the molecule. So we always make sure that uh, with any channel or receptor we're trying to control that, uh, that we've left the channel alone when it's in its, when the photo switch is in its off state. Why do you add extra GABA? I'm sorry? Add extra GABA. Yes. No, we're, we're, well, so it's an antagonist. So to get the receptor to be activated, you need to add GABA. So that's why. Oh, I thought GABA was on the molecule. Well, it's not GABA, it's something else, but it's serving as an antagonist. It's not, it's not activating the receptor. It's just occupying the site without allowing the, without allowing the receptor to activate. So these are all, the, we actually have light activated agonists as well, but I'm going to be talking today just about antagonists. <clears throat> so if you express this mutant alpha subunit uh, in, in, a, a, in a neuron, a real neuron, and uh, the neuron will have other subunits for GABA receptors that it normally expresses, so now you'll end up creating a receptor, hopefully, that has your mutant subunit that will be sensitive to the chemical, and, and we can target expression to different cell types by, for example, you know, using cell type specific promoters. So this was a cam kinase 2 promoter that uh, leads to expression in, in pyramidal cells. Um, we can now, uh, we can now get this thing to integrate into synapses. So now you can actually photo control inhibitory postsynaptic currents, IPSCs. And so, you know, this is a hippocampal slice, so this is a classic sort of situation where we are recording from the CA1 neuron and we're electrically stimulating inputs, but we're blocking uh, all the excitatory inputs and just looking at synaptic inhibition. And we can go back and forth and shine different colors of light on the preparation. And if you do that, what you find is that you can uh, antagonize or, you know, block or reduce the amplitude of IPSCs. And you can see it's not doing anything to the sort of paired pulse ratio, uh, but it's reducing the amplitude of these inhibitory postsynaptic currents. So, so it works nicely in, in, that was the, uh, I could tell you that was the alpha one isoform of the, yeah, of this alpha subunit. Yes. Exactly. Uh, you know, here the light was on continuously. <clears throat> right. Um, so there are, in the, in the mammalian genome, there are six uh, separate genes encoding different alpha subunits. Uh, and for each one of these, we're able to find a place where we can substitute uh, the native amino acid with a cysteine and sort of co-opt the receptor and turn it into a light antagonized 
receptor. This shows the uh, a percent antagonism by light. Uh, some of these were pretty easy because it was exactly the same site for, for all of these, all of these isoforms. But we did have to use different chemicals. Um, I have chemists that, uh, that are postdocs in my lab that actually made these compounds. And as you can see, for, for all of these, we were able to have, uh, have a situation where the tethered, uh, ligand was uh, antagonizing the receptor when it's in its trans configuration. I guess not all of them, but for many of them, we had the antagonism work when the molecule is extended, the way I illustrated it before. But in some cases, uh, depending on where you put, where exactly you put the mutation, you could flip the, the situation upside down. So now it's the cis form of the molecule that's antagonizing the receptor, and when you hit it with the other wavelength of light, you relieve that antagonism. So, you know, this alters uh, sort of the default situation in the absence of light. Is the, uh, is the receptor going to be blocked or is it going to be made available? And so we have a lot of flexibility in that. Um, I'm not going to tell you, I'll tell you a little bit about these different alpha, about a couple of these different alpha isoforms, but uh, the sort of dogma is that alpha-1 two and three are in GABA receptors found at synapses, and four, five, and six are supposed to be extrasynaptic mediating tonic inhibition. Now, I'll get back to that in a little bit. So, um, so, you know, at first we were just taking this mutant isoform and expressing it in neurons overexpressing it. So uh, the native isoform is still there, and by overexpressing it, you know, we didn't know whether the functions we might attribute to that receptor were because, you know, we were turning it on and off or because we, you know, we, we added extra receptor to the cell. So really to get around this problem, we, we, uh, we decided to substitute the native receptor with one that has this mutation in it. And uh, this was before the days of CRISPR, so this was hard to do and cost a lot of money and took a lot of time, and so, but we used homologous recombination and struggled and spent a lot of money, and eventually we're able to come up with mice where the, uh, the, the genomic uh, uh, receptor gene was, had this mutation built into it. So here's the mutation for the alpha subunit. We also, as you will see, alpha-1 subunit. We also did this for the alpha-5 subunit. So now we have these uh, endangered species, lines of mice that, uh, that have this, uh, that are photoswitch ready. All you need to do is add the compound and you have light activated uh, uh, GABA receptors. And um, if you, for example, take this alpha-1 mouse and look at different cells in the nervous system that we think express alpha-1, so for example, uh, stellate or basket cells in the, in the cerebellum, you find that you can photoregulate the iPSCs just in the way I showed you previously, uh, whereas if you look at another cell that is not thought to express alpha-1, you see no effect of light. So that kind of aligns. Um, and we've done it with other parts of the nervous system as well. Okay, so, uh, you know, I'm not going to talk about doing this too much, but we can actually photoregulate these receptors in vivo and look at uh, all kinds of things in the, in the intact nervous system. This was done in collaboration with Halal Adesnik, who's also at Berkeley, <clears throat> who uh, does a lot of in vivo uh, recording and imaging. This was recording from visual cortex, displaying an image, uh, and measuring gamma oscillations elicited by the onset of the sensory uh, stimulus, and, and then uh, taking light and altering these GABA receptors uh, and showing that you can in vivo alter the, the power of these gamma oscillations. I'm not going to talk much more about that, but in, you know, you can do this by you know, the, the, the neurons already express this mutant channel. You can just inject a bolus of the photoswitch chemical into the brain. Just put a, uh, a pipette through the dura and inject, and you can, you can, uh, you can, uh, photosensitize the receptors in that vicinity. Okay. Um, so, uh, 
I'm not going to talk about this much either. This is all just setting up the, the methodology. But because al so alpha-1 is expressed in many different cells in the nervous system, this is the cortical microcircuit of inhibitory interactions between neurons in the, in the cortex. They all have GABA receptors. Um, and uh, one, by doing paired recordings or by doing uh, optogenetics, we could look at each of these synapses individually and ask the question, what is the contribution of alpha-1 containing GABA receptors to the EPSCs in that particular connection? And so we've done this for all, I guess it's all seven of these possible connections. We've also done uh, some other, other cell types that aren't shown here. But you can see some interesting things. One is that the same neuron, the, uh, the pyramidal neuron, gets input from PV cells and somatostatin cells. And if you look at the, EP, the IPSCs, uh, the IPSC number one over here, there was a big effect of light, which means that alpha-1 contributed a lot to the, the receptors at this synapse. But if you look at synapse number two, uh, there's almost no photosensitivity of, of those IPSCs. And so there's almost no alpha-1 contributing to that synapse. So this individual cell, even though you can characterize it by what genes it expresses, its transcriptome, uh, you know, that's, that's a great oversimplification of, of what's going on in that cell, because that cell can put different receptors in different locations. And so, you know, understanding what a cell does just by knowing its transcriptome is, is not going to be sufficient for really understanding how a circuit works. <clears throat> okay. Um, so, now let's get on to the, the meat of what this talk was supposed to be about, um, which is uh, what's the role of GABA receptors in, in plasticity? And um, so we looked at uh, the hippocampus, um, and when we decided to make these knock-in mice that had photoswitch-ready receptors, you know, we had uh, a lot of choices. We had six different isoforms and uh, only so much money and time. So we chose alpha-1 because it is the most widely expressed GABA receptor present at inhibitory synapses throughout the brain. And, we, and the next one we picked was alpha-5 because you can see where it's, it likes to be expressed, and that's in the hippocampus, particularly in CA1. Uh, it really is uh, very concentrated here. There's some expression in the neocortex, and there's some in the olfactory bulbs. But it's really striking how strongly expressed it is in the hippocampus. And for this reason, uh, pharmaceutical companies have sort of uh, jumped on uh, this receptor with the thought, here's an inhibitory receptor in the hippocampus. Maybe if we block its activity, we'll be able to enhance cognition, learning, and memory. So there's big programs at Merck and other, other companies that try to make antagonists that are selective for this alpha-5 isoform of the GABA receptor. And one of the early things that people did was knock out alpha-5. And they found, of course, that it has, it affects learning and memory. But exactly how and what it's doing was, remained pretty unclear. Are there differences in the channel between alpha-1 and alpha-5? There is. Um, alpha-5 is much slower, uh, supports slower IPSCs. We'll get back to that in the end. <clears throat> and as I said, the, the, the dogma was, was that it was extrasynaptic. Okay, so, um, so if we uh, set up the same scenario I told you before, we're recording from a CA1 neuron, stimulating inhibitory interneurons electrically. If we, if we look at this alpha-1 knockout, we photosensitize those receptors, uh, you see that there is this was sort of a smaller effect for some reason, but this is the onset of stimulation electrical stimulation here, the IPSCs, and you can see that light alters the magnitude, the amplitude of those IPSCs, as I've already shown you. But if you look at the alpha-5 knock-in mouse, you see no effect of light, which is consistent with, you know, it not being at, at those synapses. Um, if you overexpress alpha-5 uh, by using a virus that introduces the gene for this photoswitch-ready version, you can force it to go into synapses, but on, under ordinary conditions, it, it's not there. 
Um, and on the other hand, if you look at tonic inhibition, what that means is that you're just holding the membrane potential at a steady level, uh, at a depolarized level, probably to suppress excitatory uh, EPSCs. Uh, and you flip the light back and forth, you can see that there's some steady current that is going through these receptors that is, photos, that is photosensitive. And if you add picrotoxin, which blocks all the GABA receptors, this goes away. So just as expected, this is extrasynaptic, or it's, it's mediating tonic inhibition, whereas alpha-1 is mediating phasic synaptic inhibition. So, and, you know, and then we looked at LTP, uh, which I was telling Cliff a, a while ago, I was a postdoc, and uh, yeah, I worked in labs that worked on synaptic plasticity my whole training, uh, and the last one was Steve Siegelbaum's lab, and I never worked on LTP. So this was the very first opportunity I ever had to uh, actually, uh, you know, actually see this with my own eyes, even though a postdoc in my lab actually did the recordings. Uh, so we, you know, we looked at, this is Chris Davenport was the first author on this paper, which I'll be talking about a lot. Uh, and in the usual way, we stimulated uh, Schaefer collaterals and recorded from CA1 neurons and gave a high frequency barrage or a theta burst. Uh, and you could see the, you know, long term potentiation of EPSCs. Uh, I, uh, in my sort of long reading of papers about LTP, almost none of them uh, sort of did what we're doing here, which is keep inhibition intact while you're trying to elicit LTP. Uh, we need to keep inhibition intact to ask what the contribution of inhibition is to this process. So uh, I think maybe it's a smaller amount of LTP than you no normally would see uh, in a lot of the classic papers. And But you can see here that when we photo switched alpha-5, we had absolutely no effect on LTP. So, so far, everything is really boring. Uh, alpha-5 doesn't seem to do anything interesting. But it gets more interesting when you start repeatedly stimulating. So here now are four uh, theta burst episodes, I guess, uh, and looking at what happens. And if you look at the uh, green uh, traces here, these are when the alpha-5 isoform is unblocked. It's operating normally. And I'm sorry, the, the purple one is where it's operating normally. I get this backwards myself all the time. You can see the first Theta burst gave you, you know, a significant amount of potentiation of now these are excitatory postsynaptic currents, right? Um, and you can see that there's LTP of those excitatory synapses. If you stimulate a second time, the, incrementally there's less LTP from a second round of stimulation. The third time there's even less incremental uh, increase in these EPSCs. And finally, it looks like you've saturated your ability to induce LTP. And that's, that's shown here. You can see that when alpha-5 is unblocked, it's operating uh, normally, you see this apparent saturation of LTP. And I think a lot of the field sort of uh, considered that this was some saturation of some one of the events in the cascade, for example, activation of CAM kinase 2, or maybe phosphorylation of the substrates for CAM kinase 2. Some step in this process was saturating, and after you try to get more and more and more LTP, you just can't get any more. But um, this experiment told us that that's not the case, because if you simply block alpha 5 during this stimulation protocol, you find that that apparent saturation goes away. And now you can keep adding more and more LTP. Eventually, of course, it, something will saturate. But, um, but this, this process, which looked like saturation of this kind of plasticity, was just sort of a mirage. It's due to the fact it's something that is sensitive to the role of alpha-5. And this was a big surprise. Um, and we tried to figure out what was going on here. So right here is an interaction between inhibition and excitation, for those who, of you who are confused by this. Okay, if we did the same experiment, but now using photosensitive alpha-1 mice, um, 
now manipulating receptors containing that alpha-1 subunit had no effect on LTP and no effect on the apparent saturation of LTP. So there's something special about alpha-5. Oh, boy. <laughs> okay, I've got to go much faster. Um, so, so this correlates with what I've just told you. Uh, I mentioned that, that there's no contribution of alpha-5 to iPSCs before theta birth stimulation. In fact, they, the green and the purple lines over, you know, superimpose almost exactly. But what we discovered is that after, L, uh, TP, after a theta birth stimulation, now you start to see that there is some photosensitive current there. And um, if, we, uh, if we put MK801 in the pipette, which is a blocker of NMDA receptors, which also blocks L uh, induction of LTP, we didn't see this happen. So there's something about inducing LTP that allows this receptor or forces this receptor to migrate from extrasynaptic locations to synaptic locations. And, and we, I'm not going to show you the data for this, but we've been able to show that the tonic inhibition goes down as the, or the contribution of this, the tonic inhibition goes down as, as its contribution to synaptic inhibition goes up. So, so, you know, the next question is, is this relocation of this receptor to synapses necessary for this restraint on LTP that I showed you about before? Uh, we used a tool that Don Arnold, uh, who some of you uh, some, was mentioned yesterday, uh, he has these intrabody molecules that recognize different targets in the cell. One of them is recognizing Jeffrin, which is a scaffolding protein for GABA receptors. And if you express this intrabody, uh, this particular intrabody has um, e E3 ligase, which ubiquitinates target proteins, so you can basically condemn to death Jeffrin, and so you can see the Jeffrin disappear in cells that are expressing this, this tool, and because there's no more Jeffrin, there's no more scaffold for GABA receptors, and basically synaptic inhibition just goes down to almost nothing. You can see that these spontaneous iPSCs disappear, uh, although the, the GABA receptors are still there, they're just no longer localized at synapses. And this is a little complicated, but um, when, you, when you do this, when you get rid of Jeffrin and you look at the EI ratio, this is the ratio of EPSCs to IPSCs, the IPSC contribution when you're stimulating the circuit together almost completely disappears. That's evidence that you've really eliminated synaptic inhibition. <clears throat> and when we do this, uh, when we do this and look at this cumulative LTP, we can see that if you disrupt inhibitory synapses, now LTP, um, uh, you, I'm sorry, let's get this right here. Uh, ordinarily, you can get LTP on the first of these theta birth stimulations, but not much after three or four of them. But if you disrupt inhibitory synapses, just like blocking alpha-5, you keep getting more and more LTP. And there's a very nice relationship between how much we've altered this EI ratio and to how much of this sort of uh, non-saturating process remains. Um, this is a, a little bit difficult to get your head around. But let's move on to this. So what, what does this process of moving alpha-5 into inhibitory synapses actually do electrophysiologically? I'm going to show you that it suppresses NMDA-mediated plateau potentials, which were discussed a lot yesterday. So what we've done here is record from one CA1 neuron before theta burst stimulation, and then go back and record from other ones after theta burst stimulation. And um, before theta burst stimulation, now you've got excitation and inhibition sort of operating in parallel through this little microcircuit, there's EPSPs impinging on the cell you're recording from, there's the inhibitory interneurons delivering IPSCs, and they're kind of all mixing together, and what you see is the EPSC sort of dominates the situation, and there's no effect of in manipulating alpha-5 receptors. But if you do this after you've induced LTP, what you find is that when you block alpha-5, you know, you unveil this gigantic um, plateau potential, 
which disappears entirely when you block NMDA receptors. And so the idea is that this migration of alpha-5 into inhibitory synapses actually serves to suppress this plateau potential. It would happen much more if you, uh, if you didn't have alpha-5 around. And so <clears throat> we think it's this uh, that is preventing further LTP from being induced because you're preventing this kind of phenomenon from happening. Okay, so let me just say a couple words, because I've got one minute left, about what keeps these alpha-5 receptors in their particular uh, uh, locations. There's a scaffold, I mentioned Jeffrin already, which is a synaptic scaffold, but there's a completely separate extrasynaptic scaffold called radixin. And radixin is a phosphoprotein, and it turns out it only binds alpha-5 receptors when it's in its phosphorylated state. And what activity is thought to do is alter the phosphorylation site, state of radixin. And so what we were able to do is, is develop uh, uh, tools that would change the phosphorylation state of radixin and then express them in these neurons. So here is a pseudo-phosphorylated mutant that has a negatively charged amino acid where that phosphorylation site would normally be. So this acts like it's already phosphorylated. And so this should hold the receptor in its extrasynaptic location. And what we find is that um, LTP fails to drive alpha-5 into synapses, and that when we express this thing, we don't see any photoswitching of, of um, of the IPSCs when we express this mutant. And then the opposite is a phosphorylation incompetent mutant that now has, um, now has an alanine at the normal phosphorylation site. And so these receptors are never held by those radixin scaffolds and they start out in the synaptic location and they're always contributing to the IPSCs. And you can see under those and, and that situation that IPSCs, and, and this, this goes to your question, they're a little bit longer. They have a time constant of decay that's about twice as long. And this, these, the amount of current this thing uh, introduces is very small. It's, but when you string a lot of these IPSCs together by giving high frequency stimulation, the envelope of this inhibition is, is larger and more importantly, lasts longer. So this is the model that we have here. We have these two different scaffolds. Alpha-5 can go back and forth between them depending on the phosphorylation state of the radixin. Uh, when the, when, and, and that is triggered by calcium somehow. We don't quite understand. But when these receptors take up residence at, in inhibitory synapses, now they're extending, prolonging inhibition long enough, and it turns out we think that the kinetics match the kinetics of NMDA receptors. And so they're preventing further activation of those NMDA receptors. And we've done experiments on using reversal learning, showing that we can, uh, by blocking alpha, alpha receptors, uh, pretty dramatically change, uh, change the, change reversal learning. And I can go into this more during the question period if people are interested. So just as a summary, Endogenous alpha-5 is extrasynaptic at rest. <clears throat> if you overexpress it, you can force it into inhibitory synapses. If you elicit LTP, it will drive these receptors into inhibitory synapses. After LTP, this alpha-5 receptor suppresses NMDA receptor-mediated responses. The redistribution of, of alpha-5 is necessary for restraining this accumulation of LTP. Um, and restraining LTP may be important for clamp maintaining synaptic strength, clamping synaptic strength. It also, I'm not, I didn't talk about it, suppresses LTD as well as accumulation of LTP. And, um, and this is the part that I wanted to talk about maybe uh, at the end or during the question period. The, the contribution of these receptors to dendritic integration is negligible they really seem to specifically affect plasticity. So that's why I'm calling them the anti-NMDA receptors. They don't really do much in terms of computation. And they're, they're pretty silent. Um, 
And so this is the kind of thing I think that uh, modelers should keep in mind, that there's a lot of silent things you're not going to know about just by measuring spikes, uh, et cetera. And, and we would like to know the spatial and temporal scales over which this kind of inhibition operates. So these are the people that did the work. Um, Chris Davenport was the first author on this paper that, uh, and I'm really proud of him, he's now at uh, St. Jude's Research Center in Tennessee. A lot of other people contributed. Wen Shen was the chemist who made the photo switches for GABA receptors. And I have to disclose that I have a financial interest in a company really interested in making tools for, for blindness. So it's not really so relevant to this. Thank you. Thank you. Rob. Oh, that's, that's a cool story. Thanks. Um, first of all, actually, on your last point about dendritic integration, it looked like the alpha-5 contribution when you shut it down was around 50 picolamps. So what, how does that affect the input resistance of the cell? To, 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 I'm sorry. So you, you, you claim that the alpha-5 don't really affect dendritic integration. But if they're extrasynaptic and responsible for tonic inhibition, aren't they affecting leak? And so if you shut them down, you should change yeah, I, resistance? We did some experiments just to measure input resistance. It was like, I mean, that tonic inhibition is really tiny. Mm -hmm. And actually, we typically, uh, we had to amplify it in different ways to see it at all. And also, how quickly can the Redixin break be released? If instead of spacing out your four theta bursts, you push them all together and really hit the cell, can you drive massive LTP before the alpha fives can shut it down? We tried looking at that. It was, it was sort of difficult to get a hard answer. I mean, we kind of ran out of postdoc time uh, <laughs> that it would require to actually answer that carefully. So that's a good question, but we don't really know. Yeah, really interesting story. Um, have you tried like using a higher amplitude? So is this a DCM type shift in the threshold, or is this really like a hard limit? Threshold for getting LTP. For getting LTP. We did we did some of that, and it didn't seem to uh, it, it. Yeah, I don't, I don't know that. So it's like a is it the question is is it a switch on off or is it a change in the threshold? I think it's it? more like a switch on off. Um, you know, if it was a change in threshold, it was a big change in threshold because we we did vary the stimulation. I mean, not so much the intensity, but how many, uh, you know, the frequency, how long a stimulation that we gave because these were theta bursts. So, you know. Yeah, I'm just wondering about which type of interneurons um, you're activating. And I, I just want to throw out, at least in the cortex, we see a lot of alpha-5 at somatostatin synapses. So the fact that you don't see in this disynaptic loop alpha-5 suggests that's probably a PV input or, or something else and non-somatostatin based. Yeah. Um, but there is alpha-5 at some direct synapses. Yeah, so I think I should qualify and say this is you know, purely in CA1 region of the hippocampus. We've actually looked at some other regions, including dentate gyrus. And interestingly, we see that the newborn neurons uh, actually have a lot of alpha-5 at inhibitory synapses, and they lose that as they mature. Uh, I'm not sure what that means exactly. I don't think it's really quite clear what those, you know, it's hard to know what the function of that is without knowing what the function of those newborn neurons are exactly. Um, yeah. but, but the synapses that you're looking at here, you think they're probably PV synapses. Um, you know, we don't know. We're the ones that we're electrically stimulating with an extracellular electrode are. We don't know. We don't know what they are. So if I at least I don't know what they if, are. If I extrapolate <laughs> from seeing a lot of alpha five at somatostatin output in the neocortex, then if alpha five is liberated by this high frequency stimulation, it could be enhancing. It could also be moving into somatostatin synapses as well. Do you know if it's synapse specific? We don't know that. We've looked a lot at where alpha 1 is. We looked at the synapse specificity mm -hmm. of that, as I've shown yeah, you. Yeah. But we haven't done the same with alpha 5.
So when you were limiting uh, alpha one uh, subunits, I understand you did not see major effect, but if you destabilize gabber urgic synapses with, uh, with a Jeffrey finger, you saw an effect on alpha two. Is that, is that isn't it surprising that alpha one did not perhaps change the threshold for inducing LTP? Um, we didn't look at the threshold for LTP, but we didn't see, so I'm not sure exactly what. So when we photo switched alpha five, we saw no change in, right, no change in, in the magnitude of LTP. Um, we weren't looking at threshold necessarily, right? But I mean, I mean the alpha one one, which I understand. I'm sorry, alpha one. In the, in the yes, exactly. So there I understand you showed an LTP experiment at the bottom of, of the slide with the alpha five, where you saw this nice effect that you actually get bigger LTP, but with the alpha one, nothing much has changed. That's right. Yeah, it is. But remember, we're talking about LTP at excitatory synapses, and and we're talking about manipulating what. Yeah. So we saw no effect in the magnitude of LTP when we photo switched alpha one. With intact inhibition, of course. Right, but we weren't looking at the threshold for eliciting LTP. We we're looking at the magnitude of LTP we did elicit with a large stimulation. Maybe the second question, maybe I missed it. The behavioral effects? Yes, I kind of went through that quickly. I said that blocking alpha-5 enhances reversal learning. So I, the idea is that by suppressing sort of run-on LTP, you're, um, you're locking in the memory of some association and maybe you're making it harder to substitute that memory with a, a new memory, a reversed memory, let's say. And so, um, and so when you inhibit this process, you now accentuate or you uh, accelerate the reversal of that memory. So, you know, one, there's this sort of, uh, counterbalance between, between behavioral flexibility and, um, and uh, what's the other term I was going to use? Stability, Stability right. And, um, and so alpha-5 is stabilizing memories, and in the absence of it, you know, I mean, I, I like to think of myself this way. I, you know, it's, it's nice to be able to learn new things, but you also want to be able to retain old things. And I, I realize that in learning theory, that those are not necessarily always in opposition. But in this case, that's a, that's the way I like to think about this. You know. Yeah, very interesting effect. And I'm just wondering about the duration of how long they remain in the in the synapses. If you wait an hour, for example, whatever, do they leave and then you can get more LTP or something like that's, that? That was my last point in this. But I, we don't really know the time scale over which this operates, and that would be really interesting to know. Okay. Uh, I think we should, well, Cliff, do you want to set up for your talk and then we could take two more questions for you? Okay, yeah. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Oh, I just wanted to make a quick comment in that many years ago, Julietta Fry found that you can induce saturating LTP. And then if you just wait an hour and now re-deliver high frequency stimulation of theta burst, boom, you can get more LTP, suggesting that the mechanism you've discovered does fade away over time, uh, acting as a form of metaplasticity that's restraining LTP over you know certain time periods. Sure. But was there any speculation about what the function of that was. No. <laughs> okay. But it's a robust effect. Right. Sorry, I was just going to address uh, a point that was just brought up. Yeah, I think it was a bit surprising at first hand that the alpha-1 did not alter um, LTP, because normally people put bicuculin in precisely to increase LTP. But it is a bit paradoxical because the net, you also increasing inhibition when you, with the alpha-1, as I understand it, because you're decreasing inhibition in the inhibitory neurons. Right, right? so there so, is a so, polysynaptic. So it's hard to say right. the net effect of alpha-1 exactly. if it's, yeah. Exactly, 
And that was one of the reasons we needed to put MK801 in our pipette, because we wanted to know that, that we were affecting inhibition in, in the cell we were recording from and not throughout the rest of the circuit. Anyway, I should get the microphone.